warning, some viewers may find this content disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. From the West Coast Dogman Project, aka the West Coast Dogman Vortex, this must mean it is once again midnight lycanthropy time here on Star Fox Radio. We are going to be taking care of some infamous business. Much better now that I am fully recharged, revamped, and ready to stalk the dog man. Let's take a walk into the darkness with Todd and myself. Creatures of the night, yes, welcome back to another episode of Midnight Lycanthropy here on Star Fox Radio. Tonight, we have Todd Metz from the West Coast Dogman Vortex, a.k.a. the West Coast Dogman Project, joining us. Todd, how you doing tonight, my friend? Long time no talk. Yeah, good, Kenny. How you doing, man? Not too bad. Just been plugging away, staying pretty busy. Sounds like you've been quite busy yourself, eh? Oh, yeah, we're busy out here on the West Coast. That's, uh, that's for sure. I, I am retired, but, uh, yeah, we're buying a new house, so it's uh, getting ready to close on that. So it's been getting ready for that. So it's been kind of crazy, for sure. Well, that's good. Well, I mean, it's good and bad, I guess. Like Chaos definitely is not a good thing, but as long as... Everything kind of paves out in the end. This is a plus, eh? Oh, yeah, for sure. So uh, what's going on in the world of Dogman with you uh, out there on the East Coast? (laughs) Oh, just stacks and stacks of stuff I've been working on. Got the fourth edition of the field manual done for the North American Dogman project finally, which is pretty good. That was like 177 pages. So been doing that. And then also just been plugging away here with great guests as such as yourself on Midnight Lycanthropy and been working with my science team, Colleen, William, as well as Nuxium and some other people just really trying to get all our stuff lined up. And we're looking to hopefully add a few biologists and maybe a zoologist and a couple other people to our team. So I've been trying to work on that a bunch. And then in August, the North American Dogman Project podcast, we're rebooting, is going to be up on plugging away on that as well. And then also in the fall, Doug and Alex have been talking about rebooting Monster Quest, and they want to bring myself and Jody and the North American Dogman Project on the board to handle the Dogman research. And so, yeah, it's just been pretty much stacked up in a very good way my friend wow that's awesome yeah i'd love to see uh, monster quest come back uh, i used to watch that uh, back uh, in the mid 2000s some good shows some stuff on uh, i know they did some stuff on werewolves wolfman dogman type stuff had some pretty good guests and whatnot on there i seem to have some good research so yeah i get to uh, good to see you working with those folks Hopefully you can uh, get a roll in again. That'd be great. Uh, get a good couple episodes on uh, on the Dogman phenomenon. Hey, more we talk about it, the closer we get to an answer, right? 
Yes, no, thank you very much. Kind words. And again, preach, my friend. This is very true. The more stuff gets put out there, the better it definitely is for individuals to be able to get back and really understand, you know, what's occurring. I can't really dive too much into detail about in regards, but I can say that Doug is going to have a lot more of 100% hands-on control because he's going to be able to be doing it not through a large network like before with a history channel. He can do it now through YouTube, Tubi, Hulu. There's a ton of options. I'm not fully sure on how that's all going to unfold, but it will be really good to have him be able to have full hands on because you know how it is when you work with large production companies and such and other people are investing time and money you don't always have all the power you wish you could even if you create something it's definitely pretty exciting for sure and he's got a ton of stuff lined up and all the original people want to pop back on all the people he's had from the original monster quest the science crew and everything so it should definitely be really good and then besides that as i stated just really working with our science team and we've come up with definitely a few really quality theories about how there is substantial evidence supporting that prehistoric creatures such as the short-faced bear and cave hyenas the dinopithecus and dire wolves we have really substantial reasoning to believe that some of them are still popping around and we've been putting some pieces together and coming to the conclusions that we believe some of if not at least half of the dog man encounters and the sightings could really have something to do with all those animals we stated about and that would also classify into the category of something being a physical entity and being here also we do acknowledge and understand there are people that are having paranormal aspects and experiences as well which still definitely falls underneath the dog man triangle or the dog man square or however people would like to describe how we're trying to dissect it but there is definitely a difference between the physical ones and then ones that are if say if you hold up a flashlight or something where you're able to see transparency through it so we're just really trying to distinguish that and you know get some people on board and with science and such you do have to word your words properly you do have to make sure your presentation is aligned and well presented because you don't always get numerous chances to speak to individuals like that so i've just been really sitting down and working on how I present my topics to people of the scientific community and things have been going good and such. I mean, there's a way to present stuff. Unfortunately, until science recognizes things such as paranormal activity as evidence, they don't. So if I'm addressing somebody that may never have heard about much of this or maybe on the border, it's important to make sure that when I do reach out to them, I specify who I am. And yes, I am involved with the North American Dogman Project, but then I continue to express that we do believe and have reasons to believe that these, yes, everyone knows those animals did exist. We have footprints that do not really fall into line as to what some of the native animals could be. And then we have people going missing around cave systems. This is all science right here, you know? So once I'm able to sit down and start to speak to them about that, then now you don't come off as a looney tune, I guess, unfortunately. You know what I mean? Whereas if you just start telling them, oh yeah, the dog man, and it's supposed to be some sort of raging werewolf, et cetera, which it's not, but more or less, you can't really approach science like that. So. That's pretty much it right there, man. Oh, uh, yeah, no doubt. Uh, yeah, that's super stuff. I'm glad that, uh, you know, we're, you know, it's been a long time coming. I know uh, a number of other uh, folks have tried to, you know, reach out to the scientific community uh, to get their uh, take on all of this. And, of course, you know, without uh, empirical data, you know, and, and some sort of scientific proof that they do exist, it's super hard to get anybody to, you know, to come in and, and talk with folks about this stuff. I'm glad to see you're, you know, trying to put together a logical uh, presentation to talk with these folks and to get them, uh, you know, to at least listen, you know, to some theories, uh, get uh, them to listen to some of the little bit of the fact as we know it uh, is out there and and hopefully be able to move forward a little bit with this, uh, you know, small steps and, and uh, 
good conversation uh, and discussions between the uh, cryptid community and the scientific community. I mean, it's a long time coming where there's some crosstalk going on there. And I know, uh, you know, like I said, that people have tried and, and, you know, without reason. And I know, you know, Lee Hempel out in, uh, in Wisconsin, he's got some pretty good, some pretty good data uh, on, you know, the encounters and sightings that they've had out there. And he's, you know, I mean, he can't even get anybody really, uh, I, at least the last I heard, uh, that uh, would look at the, the DNA evidence, um, you know, so it's even hard to get to get labs to even analyze some of this stuff. So, yeah, um, best of luck with that. And let us know at West Coast uh, if there's anything that we could do to, uh, to back you up on that. I'm sure that, uh, you know, we would uh, we would be glad to do whatever we can as well. Very kind words, and I do agree with all that. It is very tough, and like I said, it's all about sometimes how you get that first impression with individuals and what you're able to present. And unfortunately, in the time and age we're in, I mean, technology is great. I love it. We can do so much with technology, but also it's now made videos and photos really not substantial evidence. But when it comes to castings, video of consecutive footprints, quadrupedal, bipedal, claws that don't belong to any known animals into the area vocalizations footprints that look like they could be hyena because bear and hyena look very much alike yet to an untrained eye they would probably just take it as a bear also baboons footprints in the back can look like a bear as well and there's a lot right there where science you know again everything i just spoke of has nothing i didn't once use the term dogman or werewolf i just pretty much stated things that we have that are factual and it's the way I'm trying to like I said approach it because that way that's what science wants they want to you know hear vocalizations they want to see you know not just one footprint but more than one areas if there are scratch marks here well okay you were able to remove a claw excellent the cave systems in Saudi Arabia where the hyenas had pulled in the bones evidence you can see the chew marks so those are like I said until science you know, I guess opens up their doors a little bit more or blinders. That's really how you have to present it. And luckily I had a few people that were already intrigued about the paranormal aspects. So I didn't have to dance around so much with them yet. There were a few others that had no interest or I shouldn't say interest, just never really turned on their brain to dive into this just because they're working on other things that are presented to them by the schools they work for etc but they are actually pretty baffled by some of the footprints and some of the vocalizations we have and they've expressed interest in sitting down and working more with us as well but they just as i stated have other stuff that they are stacked up with because they're good biologists and they're good scientific minds so of course if we would like to work with them obviously other people see the value in them and are working with them as well so yeah it takes time but also again i have never spoken to the gentleman you were speaking about that has the dna that all sounds super awesome but again i just wonder maybe when he presented his case to somebody who knows how it was worded maybe the person that heard certain words is like yeah i'm all set with dealing with this now and you would like to think you don't have to dance so much like that but of course it's kind of in to the average person a taboo topic to speak of stuff like that and scientific mainstream if you want to get involved in that like sasquatch and things you need to present stuff and that's how science works we're almost there and we've kind of gotten out of because the cryptid communities are good there are good people in there i would never met yourself or others but then there's also so much crap and so much insanity too okay and i think that's a big reason why science stays away from that because you have people attacking each other over theories on these pages man and you just have these outrageous outrageous takes but then something that's more logical the outrageous takers are like yo that can't be happening that can't be happening and if you ever want to elevate yourself out of that and be taken credible like paleontologists with dinosaur fossils and such you have to be able to present evidence okay and i've used this theory before where they found species of dinosaurs that they weren't sure if they were part of the same gene pool it was just a juvenile or it was a completely different species and it went on for 
10, 15, 20 years until they were finally able to get a bunch of evidence supporting that it was an actual different species. It wasn't a juvenile of that adult. And they got to that point because they were sitting down and articulating evidence. I'm sure maybe behind scenes, just because people have egos, sure, some of those paleontologists might think so-and-so, oh, I'm better than them. That's just humans in general, okay? If they did think that way, they didn't present it out to the public. They presented stuff that was very well put together, formal hypothesis, theses, theories, and then boom, it all comes to play and they were able to solve it. So if anyone who researches anything encrypted ever wants to present something to the scientific community, A, you have to play by the rules, but you also need to make sure that you are working as a team and that you don't look like a bunch of buffoons. You see what I'm saying? Because if you're sitting there all arguing and just coming up with these outrageous takes, uh, that just, A, makes people that want us never to figure out the answer sit there and chuckle. And also, it makes the scientific community be like, yeah, I'm all set with this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, it, the, the crossover is uh, is is going to be, uh, you know, it's going to take time and get the right people. Um, there is one individual, um, I don't know if you uh, know uh, Eric Mantel, you probably have talked to him. Hopefully, uh, if you haven't, uh, you should. Uh, he was out in Wisconsin there a couple of years ago. They had a wildlife biologist with them, and she is interested uh, in uh, the dogman phenomenon um, and has worked with uh, with Eric and his team a couple of times on some field investigations out there. So he would be a good person to reach out to uh, to get in contact with her. And maybe there's uh, maybe there's some some um, possibilities there as well. Like I said, uh, I'm, she's a wildlife biologist who actually has been looking into the tapetum lucidum uh, phenomenon with these creatures. You know, with the you know with the amount of reports and sightings that uh, these creatures have uh, self illuminating eyes or bioluminescent eyes, if you will. So she's been looking into that. Um, so yeah, I mean. Best of luck with that. Uh, you know, it, it is not an easy thing. I know what you got, uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum out there that's been looking at, uh, you know, Sasquatch for, for decades. There's one other wildlife biologist. I can't think of his name. I think Jeff is an anthropologist. Uh, but there's one other guy out there that uh, I think works with him that's uh, a biologist as well. So there's, it, I think the, the pool is small, but hopefully... You know, folks like yourself uh, and your team uh, can increase the size of that pool, present some, you know, present some good theories, uh, you know, some evidence as we as we have it, which I know is 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 slim. But, uh, you know, I think it's going to take uh, it's, it's going to take a, um, a pretty intense effort to, to cross over into mainstream science with with this. And if you can present it, you know, from creatures that you know, had existed in the past that may exist today. You know, I haven't looked at that too much myself um, from a um, anthropological, you know, um, standpoint. But, you know, it's not to say that that's not happening out there. Um, you know, you get uh, probably a lot of different comments uh, on why that could be and why that probably couldn't be, you know. So I think uh, like anything else, you got to present a strong argument and uh, do the best you can if that's uh, that's the road that that, that you know we're going to take it to try to solve this thing, and I think it's uh, it's all good. Very well stated again, and I do appreciate the kind words. And as you stated, yes, of course, there is nothing that's always going to be easy. Yet when it comes to evolution and such, ten thousand, eleven thousand years ago is. Ooh, that's a blink of the eye, okay? If we were talking about 240 million, all right, now we're stretching a little bit, okay? But 11,000 years ago, that's pretty almost yesterday in the realm of Earth's existence. And when you look at, for example, I'll just use the short-faced cave bear, there really is no reason for that to go extinct. Scientists as well as paleontologists are pretty sure that humans didn't really go out of their way to mess with these type of predators. Sure, they also the humans hunted their food sources, but humans hunt grizzly bears' food sources as well. Sure, there might have been times where some of these animals might have been coming and taking people, attacking their tribes, so they would go to the cave and hunt down this cave bear. But realistically, who 
wants to go into a deep cave because cave bears spent the majority of their life inside of caves. They would come out to hunt, but they go back in and travel all through the cave systems. Okay. So why would we want to, you know, go in there and try to battle this beast when you can just avoid it, you know, and go amongst your living. It's no different now than, yeah, sure. You have the big game hunters and such, but I'm talking about from the evolutionary survival aspect points, like grizzly bears and wolves don't really try to, clash with each other unless it's need be so okay a short-faced bear is a much better version of a grizzly bear it's a little bit bigger it's faster it's stronger so why would that have gone extinct right there i mean it, if it was able to feed on some of the larger versions of moose with ease it's going to be able to catch a moose from today with a heck of a ton of ease and there's plenty of moose and caribou out there and humans like to be congregated into areas so for as many of us as there are in the United States, there's still a ton of areas where people don't get out and about. And the short cave bear's whole reign was pretty much in North America in the cave systems. So right there, we'll just use that for an example. And then you got the ring docus, 1890, that looked like either a dire wolf or a hyena, 1890 now. Okay, we're not talking about 11,000 years ago. We're talking about a few hundred years ago now. Okay, so where did that thing come from? And recently, our environmentalist uh, was talking about how there's been some cattle mutilations and the teeth marks on there didn't match up to other known predators. And it actually matched up to a dire wolf perfectly. Okay, super interesting again. And dire wolves aren't related to modern day wolves or canines either. So their DNA wouldn't come back like that. So again, dire wolves were competing with short faced cave bears, saber tooth tigers, humans. Why would they? also have gone extinct when they were competing with modern day wolves and all kinds of other known predators and things that are still there. And again, they were hunting some of the bigger caribou and such. They're going to have no problem hunting moose and deer that exist now. And when you look at cave hyenas, again, spent the majority of their lives in cave systems. Hyenas are hardy as heck. You could take a spotted hyena from Africa right now and put it in, as long as it had a population where it could produ reproduce without being incestual and having inbreeding, it would be able to create a offspring that would survive in an area such as Arizona, California, Africa gets just as cold as those places. But now you're taking an apex predator out of an area, right? And putting it in an area where it doesn't have to deal with other predators like lions. Again, moral of the story is what would have caused these cave hyenas to go extinct too. And then you have people that catch and keep exotic animals and there's many documented cases for example my friend brian barber was talking about how in michigan one time they got called to an area where someone was keeping all these exotic pets like monkeys and baboons that he wasn't supposed to be and there was this one enormous baboon that was chained up in this super small cage and it had like deformed feet and he said that it's bright yellow eyes looked like they were glowing it just looked like a monster it was super aggressive and absolutely terrifying so people do have these animals throughout the country so if a spotted hyena has escaped or a baboon's escaped they're going to be able to adapt and survive but again also the dinopithecus the giant baboon that lived in south africa that a lot of people think still is existing in remote spots down there all these other animals came ac across the land bridge okay if a baboon back then was eating grass and eating mammals and such again it has all those same food sources so basically the bottom line is we're not talking about things that vanished like i said millions of years ago we're talking about things 11,000 years ago and then you got the ring docus that was in 1890 like so how do you feel about that well, it's good, uh, it's good, good analysis, good information. Yeah, I mean, I'm from back east, so I've, I've looked into uh, the Paleo Indians, uh, in, you know, 11 or 12,000 years ago. Obviously, the northeast and northern part of the United States was glaciated uh, 11 or 12,000 years ago. You know, uh, temperature changes caused the glaciers to melt, large lakes were formed. You know, uh, paleo people uh, started to really come into their own in, in uh, the Northeast, um, you know, in hunting and fishing. And, you know, and of course, they're hunter-gatherers, so they're hunting and fishing, gathering 
you know, nuts and berries and things like that as well. Um, so, yes, it's kind of an interesting concept of, you know, why did some of these creatures go extinct? Uh, of course, you know, human beings didn't go extinct. It didn't go extinct uh, during uh, the Ice Age or the end of the Ice Age when these paleo people really started to come into their own uh, and started to make, lar you know, larger villages. They weren't uh, wanderers like many people think, you know, as much as they, you know, uh, they created sedentary villages and things like that. And we're dealing with with different type of uh, different type of animals. Uh, uh, and yes, yeah, so why did these, you know, did those creatures go extinct? Human beings didn't. Um, I, I have no answer for that, uh, um, but uh, certainly interesting to think about it. Although, you know, when you put the dog man, you know, phenomenon into that, where does that fit? You know, if you start looking at people's sightings and encounters of upright, supposed canine, you know, uh, creatures that don't fit the the normal, you know, uh, wolf, don't fit the normal coyote, the the black bear uh, that will stand on two legs for short periods of time. It doesn't fit that. So, you know, the creatures that you mentioned, you know, does it fit any of those, you know, any of those creatures that could possibly be misidentified as a dog man? Of course it does. But not all of those would fall into the category of misidentified, you know, um, former creatures that did exist, you know, 10 or 12 or 13,000 years ago. So there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of data that needs to be kind of looked at there uh, as far as, you know, and I, I'll call it the crosstalk between the dogman phenomenon and, you know, uh, creatures that have supposedly gone extinct, you know, thousands of years ago. And yes, we're not talking millions of years ago, we're talking thousands of years ago. So Yes, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of of, uh, of discussion that could certainly take place there. But we also have to look at you know are all of the people misidentifying creatures that uh, are in existence, flesh and blood uh, today? Probably not. Even if it's fifty percent that are misidentifying it, the other fifty percent aren't misidentifying whatever they saw. And if they are legitimate and they are telling the truth. And we've got a 50% group of people that are seeing an unidentified, upright, canine looking creature that doesn't fit into um, any category. So, you know, there's a lot of discussion that needs to continue to, to take place. And I'm glad to see that you're, you know, you're doing that. You're taking it into a bit of a different direction, trying to get some scientific um, data, trying to talk to people who have expertise in those areas and get them interested in this to try to take this thing to the next level. So, hey, I think it's uh, I think it's great. Very kind words again. I appreciate that and everything you just stated. I agree 100%. And they're definitely not everyone's misidentifying things. Some people for sure are, and some people for sure are hoaxing, unfortunately. But as you just stated, it's definitely not all. And the only one out of what we spoke about that I think could look as if a bipedal canine like entity would be a baboon, meaning baboons very easily run on two legs and all fours quadrupedally. And they do, I encourage anyone to look them up. They can look like raging canine type, like werewolves. They have the elongated snout, the pointy ears, some have red eyes, some have yellow eyes, they have a mane and they have articulated hands. So from a distance, this is just from a distance for sure. And to even, I guess the untrained eye, like say like someone that's younger, if it's looking in their window or something, if you had somebody that 100% knows what they're talking about, that is a zoologist, a biologist, they're not gonna misidentify this, okay? But the average individual, that's what I try to explain to people, just because the term canine-like entity was used doesn't mean it has to be canine, hyenas are not canine bears are not canine baboons are not canine so that does fall into like i said a, a portion of what people are seeing for sure because you know baboons have bent back canine looking legs as well and not a lot of people are getting like close up real detailed 
encounters with these. Okay, there's a few of them floating around out there, and I have my questions about the majority of some of these really Hollywood style type encounters. Okay, insane encounters. Definitely, you need insane evidence. Meaning, like if something is sounds like it's right out of a movie, you need to show me that stuff. As I've used it before, if you got thrown through a wall, or ripped your car door off, or scratched you up, all this. Okay, that sounds great, but you need not you, but people need to be able to verify that and substantiate what's occurring. Okay, yeah, it is a lot more understandable and a lot more believable to have somebody maybe driving in their car and they see it go across the road or the field or through their yard at night. Okay. That is way more understanding than some of the encounters where they sound like they're out of a Hollywood movie. Because if you look at throughout the past, even a lot of the encounters like that, sure, some might have been more close up, but even the historical aspects don't really dive too much into this being as I said, someone interacting with it like it's a horror movie where you're running from here, it's chasing you through your house, it jumps up on your car, then you drive off through here, and then somehow you get in a firefight with it. That all sounds cool, you know? But like I said, it just needs to have the evidence to support that. And I do know we need to get you back to what you're doing, but the gentleman and the woman that you had mentioned earlier, that would be really cool if maybe potentially you could send me some contact information on that or maybe forward mine on because anyone that is educated in the topic and is willing to sit down and teach me and help me learn more and just bring merit to what we're doing is extremely welcomed. And I'm one of those individuals that I always like to learn. I don't think my theories and hypothesis are the only way that's why there's just theories and such i'm just trying to use my mind to also help figure out what's occurring and i always like i said enjoy speaking to other people that are educated because education and knowledge can be free so many times okay yes you can pay for it as well but people are willing to teach and expand knowledge for free it just others have to be open-minded to it and willing to sit down and wrap their head around it and not be naive or arrogant to think that they've already had it all figured out and not give somebody else a chance to listen because I don't think I have anything figured out and nor will I ever think that. I think, like I said, I have some pieces and such, but there's people out there that have more pieces that can help and we can figure it out, you know, instead of me just playing in my own mud puddle. So if you were able to definitely do that, I totally appreciate that. And I do honestly always appreciate your time and your knowledge on the aspect because you have a very level mind and you're very in the here and now, meaning I've never really heard you say anything that is just out of this world, meaning your theories and your thoughts are very well stated, well put. You're an educated individual. You don't give off any bing 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 red flags of hoaxing or anything like that which is why i value you and have always you know tried to collaborate with you and such so yeah keep up what you're doing my friend and keep on plugging away the way you are as well because you're definitely putting out a ton of good information as well and getting to speak to people which hey man that stuff helps me as well too because i mean i listen to what you're putting out dude so while i'm working on other stuff you know i got things like that kicking on i mean you and shane support me so i'm a super busy person but i always definitely go out of my way to reinvest the support meaning yeah if i'm working on my own videos and editing I, and i can still put on what you and shane are doing in the background and still listen and still be interacting with it because to be quite honest with you on my free time i usually just obviously watch things you know i like to learn that i enjoy but i do as i said understand people have you know invested their time in me as well so i try to always make sure that i give my time back but i also don't give my time to people that won't give their time to me if that makes sense you know so because we all like i said have a ton of different things going on. You did state this next month, you're pretty booked up. So once you get a little bit more time, I would like to get you back on and it would also give you some time to pretty much figure out some more information you want to bring on. So yeah, absolutely. Be, uh, sir, it's great to talk with you. Uh, great to be on your show. Uh, you put out good content. Uh, you're a level-headed fella. 
and uh, you know the the phenomenon needs more uh, more folks like you. And you know you don't get involved with the politics. I don't get involved with the politics as you know as some do. And it, it seems to be you know the the overall community uh, is is really really good. Uh, you know, but it is it is what it is, and we try to uh, try to do the best we can with the time that we got and the information that we have, and try to continue to listen to uh, researchers uh, and authors and people who have had encounters and try to figure this thing out obviously from a from a scientific standpoint as well so good job my friend talk to you soon thank you for everyone who stopped by tonight for another episode of midnight lycanthropy here on star fox radio if you did enjoy this episode please like subscribe and share it feed the algorithm And until next time, stay safe out there.